as quickly as they can, and new technologies like heat-assisted magnetic recording, or hammer, which you can learn more about up here, are being developed to increase the capacity of traditional hard drives. In fact, Seagate is aiming to use hammer to push out a 100 terabyte hard drive sometime around the middle of this decade. But if we can't churn out high capacity hard drives and build enough shiny new data centers to accommodate our thirst for data, not to mention find energy sources to power them all, what are the alternatives other than just purging some of that information? Well, one option is to use algorithms to compress the data. But short of some kind of big breakthrough in middle out compression, we're not anticipating huge advancements there. So perhaps more interesting is the research that's being conducted on entirely new forms of storage. Instead of using magnetic particles, for example, scientists are looking at storage solutions that take up far less physical space, such as DNA-based storage, where each base pair represents a bit, or nanomaterials, like a glass disk that can hold 360 terabytes, yet is no bigger than a coin. However, even if we find a way to encode data using subatomic particles, in other words, we find the most space efficient way to store data that the laws of physics will allow, we would still run out of space in a few centuries if we keep generating digital data at the rate that we are right now. So the bottom line is this. I wouldn't worry too much for the moment about the internet running out of space. But at some point, we might want to collectively think about just how many variants of the jealous girlfriend meme we really need to keep on our hard drives. FreshBooks is the small business accounting software that's custom built for how you want to work. Are you a small business owner or a freelancer? Well, FreshBooks is a simple way to be more productive, more organized, and to get paid faster. With FreshBooks, you can create and send out professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks to get paid up to four days faster. You can see when your client has seen your invoice to put an end to the guessing games. And you can take the whole experience with you on the go with their fully featured apps for iOS and Android. Don't take my word for it though. Try it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash techquickie. And then make sure that you enter techquickie in the how did you hear about us section. So thanks for watching guys. Like, dislike, check out our other videos somewhere. I don't know, I think there's some over there, right? There should be some. Just go find one, just go click on it. And subscribe while you're at it. Mini versions of things have historically proven to be pretty popular. The iPod mini, mini muffins, mini me. But a new one called Mini LED could have a big time effect on the way we watch TV or use our computers. But before we go any further, you guys gotta know that Mini LED is not the same thing as Micro LED. They are completely separate. Micro is also cool and you can learn more about it right up here. But Mini is the one that you might actually be able to get your hands on for an affordable price in the near future. As for why it matters, well, it first helps to understand how it relates to other kinds of TV technology. If you've ever been to a big box store and seen how striking OLED TVs are next to non-OLED models, the difference is due to the fact that OLEDs have a very high contrast ratio because individual pixels can be turned completely off, producing deep blacks without light bleed from nearby bright objects. Non-OLED TVs, on the other hand, rely on backlighting that is always turned on. To create images then, an LCD layer in front of the backlight selectively blocks the light in different areas of the screen, but it can't block the light completely, meaning that blacks can end up looking closer to gray. To improve this, LCDs use a trick to improve their contrast called local dimming. The idea is that the backlight can selectively dim or even switch off in certain areas of a screen where the image is dark or black, and local dimming can definitely help but it is far from a perfect solution. You see, TVs that have this feature typically have their backlight split into zones that dim or turn off as a group. But for the effect to work well, you need lots and lots of zones, which means lots of LEDs adding cost, heat, and power consumption. That's where mini LEDs come in. Thanks to some recent technological advances, LEDs have not only become more efficient, but also smaller, which is exactly the idea behind a mini LED display. Mini LEDs are often less than a tenth of a millimeter across, meaning that you can fit many more of them in the backlight layer of a TV, allowing much smaller zones of lighting control. To put this in context, a traditional local dimming TV from the last couple of years might have dozens or maybe a few hundreds of zones, 
while these recently released mini-LED displays from ASUS and TCL have about 1,000 individual zones. This should help them do a much better job of preventing that blooming effect that you sometimes see with local dimming, where bright objects in a dark scene have this aura or halo glowing around them, because the zone that's lighting the bright object is simply too large to be confined to the area where it's supposed to be. Of course, Mini-LED is a newer technology right now, so you can expect to pay more for it, but it's well positioned to be more affordable than OLED, especially after the early adopter tax wears off. And with micro-LED being quite a ways off from hitting the mass consumer market due to high costs and manufacturing complexity, Mini-LED looks to be an appealing option to tide us over until then. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go to Tim Hortons because I've got a sudden hankering for some mini donuts. Actually, I'm not going anywhere because I got to tell you about our sponsor. Displate is a magnet mounted metal print that's durable and doesn't require any power tools to hang it. They've got over 260,000 different art spanning a bunch of styles and influences. And with their easy magnetic mounting, you've got no holes in your wall and they're easily replaceable. They've got official Cyberpunk 2077 prints, and you can even buy one with a picture of me if you're into that. So go check out Display. They plant a tree for every Display purchased, and you can use code LTT to save 15% through the link in the video description. So thanks for watching, guys. Like, dislike, check out our other videos, and leave a comment if you have a suggestion for a future fast as possible. I might even do the whole thing instead of leaving out a word like I did a second ago. Bet you didn't even notice. Don't forget to subscribe, by the way. At some point, we've all tried to stream a fine episode of Tech Quickie and run up against a Wi-Fi range limit. So have you ever wondered, why can't we just boost it to maximum power and extend the range? To answer, we reached out to our good friend and Wi-Fi expert, Joel Crane, and we'd like to thank him for his contributions. Two of the most obvious ways that we can increase range present other technical problems. You see, at slow speeds, the modulation scheme, the small adjustments in the waveform that actually carry the data, is much simpler and easier for equipment to understand. But as speeds get faster and faster, the modulation schemes are more complicated and more prone to errors and interference. So the farther away from the access point you get, the slower you have to go. In fact, if your access point is sending out a signal and not getting any kind of reply from another gadget acknowledging that it received the signal, the AP will keep slowing the speed down and down and down until it gets a response. And this is a big part of the reason that speeds get slow if you walk farther away from your router. Now, as we demand faster speeds for high def streaming, gaming, and file transfers, simply slowing down our Wi-Fi to make it go farther isn't a viable solution. So back to more power then, right? Well, not quite. The Wi-Fi standard doesn't have a super high transmit power to begin with in order to comply with telecommunications laws in different countries. For example, in the United States, you can't go higher than 200 milliwatts, and most routers are configured by default to transmit at this maximum. So you can't turn it up any further, legally. However, that doesn't mean that getting better Wi-Fi range is a fool's errand. One trick that actually does work fairly well is to focus the Wi-Fi signal in one direction. You see, a typical home router has omnidirectional antennas where the signal is transmitted evenly in all directions and kind of like a big donut shape. But if your router is at one end of your house and your couch is at the other, that's not the best setup. Instead, you can get something called a patch antenna, which looks like a big flat panel and sends the signal out in one direction. They're more common in commercial settings or at trade shows, but there is nothing stopping you, for example, from sticking one on the side of your house and blanketing your backyard in a strong Wi-Fi signal. Another trick that's built into some Wi-Fi standards is the use of a long guard interval. Here's what this means. Between short parts of the transmission called symbols are short time intervals before the next symbol is sent. These guard intervals are there to cut down on the interference between symbols. So if they're short, you get more data, but if they're long, you get less interference and therefore longer range at the expense of some speed. Wi-Fi 6, by the way, is introducing extra long guard intervals for outdoor use where ranges often need to be longer.
Of course, another winning strategy is to cut down on interference in other ways. You can do this by using narrower channels, so by using 40 MHz instead of 80 on the 5 GHz band, as well as making sure that you don't have unnecessary transmissions flying around your house, like from baby monitors or Bluetooth devices that you aren't actually using. And this one can make more of a difference than you might think. In fact, a huge part of how wired Ethernet has gotten faster has simply been by cutting down on noise inside the cable. However, other than the tips we've mentioned in this video, I wouldn't expect too much new tech in the near future that can extend Wi-Fi range without adding more antennas in something like a mesh network. Speed and range are always going to be balancing acts, so you gotta pick. Do you want the Baconator, or do you wanna lose weight and feel good? You only get to pick one. Are you concerned about a data breach causing your credit card info to fall into the wrong hands? Here, Brandon, take this. No, that's the wrong hands. Then check out today's sponsor, privacy.com slash techquickie. They have a free, easy to use service that hides your credit card number. The way it works is by creating a virtual card number that is locked to whatever merchant you're shopping at. So even if that merchant gets hacked, the bad guys can't. There are only two options for desktop and laptop CPUs, AMD or Intel, right? Wrong, or at least sort of wrong. You see, it wasn't too long ago that in China, there were factories churning out x86 compatible CPUs that weren't actually made by either of those companies. But hold on a second. Everyone loves importing Chinese made goods on the cheap. So why didn't we see them on store shelves all over the world? To get to the bottom of this, we called in a few favors. So massive shout outs to Dr. Cutress from Anontech, Wendell from Level One Techs, and Drew Prairie for their help unraveling this. Here's what happened. Back in 2015, AMD had not released their blockbuster Ryzen series of processors yet and was struggling financially in a big way. They identified a demand for a CPU that was specifically designed for the Chinese market and Chinese government entities but they needed to jump through some hoops in order to take advantage of it. So AMD formed a joint venture with a Chinese investment consortium called Fatic. And while the joint venture was partially owned by AMD, it operated separately to a large extent. Now, of course, to build an x86 CPU, you need a lot of expertise. And AMD wasn't gonna just give away all of its secrets to how it designed its processors. So instead, AMD provided the joint venture with portions of its intellectual property that allowed it to build processors based on existing AMD core designs and make changes only to things like the processor's input-output controls or I.O., as well as cryptographic engines, possibly due to a desire of the Chinese government for added security. The resulting chips were primarily designed for the server market and even though they started turning up months before AMD actually launched any Zen-based CPUs under their own brand, it turns out that they're quite comparable to first-generation Epic processors and are even pin compatible with Epic motherboards found in other countries. But then hold on a sec. If AMD went to the trouble of starting up a joint venture in China, does this mean that you might see Chinese CPUs become a real alternative to the market dominance of Intel and AMD proper? Well, right now that doesn't look too likely. The performance isn't any better and there aren't any additional features on these Chinese chips that would make them appealing to a customer overseas. Furthermore, all AMD ever really gave the joint venture was the rights to use a core based around the first generation of Zen and nothing beyond that. And although AMD earned a good chunk of money from the joint venture, it was the broader release of Ryzen and Epic that really helped turn the company's fortunes around. In fact, the same AMD and Intel chips that you find in other countries can still be bought in China, so it isn't as if there's a glaring need for a third source of CPUs. And it also appears that the joint venture might be inactive by this point anyway. So not only has AMD not given the joint venture any Zen designs past the first generation, the Chinese chip maker is now on the US government's entity list, meaning that the joint venture can't do business with US companies, sell to any other entity on the list, or receive technology from American firms. So there are a number of these chips out in the wild currently, but it is unlikely that they're making any more. Of course, with AMD writing itself with the success of Ryzen and Epic, this isn't exactly a huge loss for them. So I wouldn't anticipate tons of x86 chips from other companies anytime soon. But even though the chips are only a few years old, they're already a collector's item if you can somehow find a way to get your hands on one. Just 
Don't expect it to make your PC any faster. It's affordable to fix or upgrade your consoles with iFixit's parts and tools. Even the Nintendo if you're in the market for a new wireless router, most of the models you'll find clearly support both 2.4 and 5 GHz Wi-Fi. We talked about the difference between these two things in this video, but there's still a burning question. Why are we still using the 2.4 GHz band, which is much slower than the more modern 5 GHz band? To answer, we reached out to our friend Joel Crane, and we'd like to thank him for his contributions. So at first glance, 2.4 GHz seems inferior. It has far less available spectrum than 5 GHz, which means less bandwidth and more interference from other devices. And the 5 GHz band's minimum connection speed is 6 megabits per second compared to just 1 megabit per second for 2.4. These minimum speeds are often deliberately used for management overhead, such as a smartphone acknowledging to the router that it did in fact receive a data packet. And devices that talk more slowly consume more time on the channel, further limiting throughput. So what's the deal? Well, first of all, there are still lots of client devices out there that only support 2.4 gigahertz. Older devices, lower end gadgets, and Internet of Things or IoT products are notorious for this. And as with many things in life, cost is a big driver behind this, as we've been making 2.4 GHz devices for a lot longer, and it's less complicated to stick a 2.4 GHz radio inside cheap electronics. By contrast, 5 GHz radios nearly always have a 2.4 GHz radio in them as well to ensure backward compatibility, meaning that a 5 GHz device is more complicated to manufacture. So even if the cost is only a few cents more per unit, that can quickly add up to a lot of money if a manufacturer is shipping millions of smart doorbells or whatever. And on the subject of smart doorbells, there just isn't any reason for many IoT devices to use the 5 GHz band, as the smart light bulb in your bedroom, for example, doesn't require an incredibly fast connection to receive the command to change from red to blue. There's even a practical advantage to this by placing low bandwidth devices, such as IoT products, on your home network's 2.4 GHz band and everything else on your 5 GHz band. You can cut down on interference and increase throughput on your 4K streams and other more data-hungry operations that way. However, some products that could actually benefit from 5 GHz Wi-Fi actually still don't have it. You see, it's common for manufacturers of products where connectivity isn't the main focus to simply tell their designers, hey, we want Wi-Fi in this thing. And the company will proceed to order the cheapest radios that you can find that will simply work, which often means devices will end up with 2.4 only support because the manufacturer doesn't know any better. You sometimes see this with products like gym equipment, where the brand is more concerned about ensuring that the pedals on the elliptical don't collapse, rather than about whether the built-in screen can deliver lag-free 1080p video playback. But there's another important reason that doesn't have anything to do with manufacturers being cheap and lazy. Range. Although 5 GHz Wi-Fi has many advantages, 2.4 still beats it in terms of range. It can go farther and is better at dealing with pesky obstacles such as walls. Again, this is important for IoT devices as well as industrial applications, meaning that not only is 2.4 GHz still popular for Wi-Fi, it's also still used for Bluetooth and smart home protocols such as Zigbee. The last thing you want is for your smart coffee maker to forget to start brewing when you wake up simply because it's too far from your router. A real modern tragedy. So even though 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi has become less common in certain situations, places like stadiums and conventions are more frequently turning it off due to interference, its combination of cost effectiveness, range, and backwards compatibility means that it will still have a home in our gadgets for quite some time. An older doesn't always mean it's worse. Just ask Finch from American Pie. Wow, I'm old. That's an old reference. If you're running a small business, you've got to check out FreshBooks. It's a cloud accounting solution specifically built for small businesses. You can get paid up to four days faster with FreshBooks and create and send professional invoices in just 30 seconds. Setting up online payments is a breeze, and you can even see when your client has seen your invoice to put an end to the guessing games. And right now, FreshBooks is offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial. So just go to freshbooks.com slash techquickie and enter techquickie in the how did you hear about us section. So thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, get subscribed, give it a thumbs up, and be sure to hit us up in the comments with your suggestions for videos that we should cover in the future.
Although there are myriad ways to stay in touch with a smartphone, texting via short message service or SMS is still ubiquitous. If you have a cell phone, you can use SMS. But why is that still the case today? I mean, think about how many apps you have that use data connections and offer such a more feature-rich experience. There's WhatsApp, Snapchat, Facebook Messenger. Yet, despite being an antiquated system, SMS is still as common among smartphone users as, say, Starbucks in New York City. So the question is, why? First off, smartphones support SMS natively. Even if you're still using an older flip phone, you can stay in touch over an SMS. There's no need to download an app and go through all the rigmarole of registering for an account with some social media platform and worrying if the person you want to contact is also on that same platform. If you have a phone number, you have SMS. That makes it very easy to reach out to someone regardless of what their other messenger app or phone maker of choice may be. This has continued to make SMS popular as a quick way to reach out to new friends and colleagues as well as with older generations who prefer the simplicity of texting over having multiple social media connected messenger accounts with extra fancy features. Wow! SMS is also very cheap, at least if you're in the US where data can get expensive. Although if you're old like me, you might remember the days when flip phones ruled the world and you only got so many texts per month included in your plan, lest you reap the anger of your parents for sending 500 texts to your BFF Jill. An increasing number of carriers are offering unlimited texting that won't chew through your data allowance. This also means in some ways, SMS can be more reliable than other messaging apps. Although you need a data connection to use GroupMe or Google Hangouts, SMS only needs a basic cell connection. So if you're in an area with limited service, SMS may be your only option for staying in touch other than making an actual phone call. Who does that? Although trying to send photos and videos over MMS, which is built on top of the SMS standard, is slower than other apps, it is still a viable option. And since SMS works over a standard cell connection, it's actually been around in some form or another since the early 1990s. And now we're in the 20s, meaning that it's become very entrenched with around 5 billion users worldwide. It has far, far more adoption than even the most popular data-based messenger services. This wide adoption has also made SMS very popular with businesses. So for example, think about how they provide short five-digit codes at sporting events to make it easy to report that drunk guy who just won't sit down, or how airlines use SMS to quickly send updates on whether your flight is delayed without you having to download any kind of additional app. Of course, the fact that SMS is a great fallback option for communication doesn't mean that itself doesn't have serious limitations. However, there is a movement afoot to bring SMS into the modern age with a protocol called Rich Communication Services, or RCS. You can learn more about it up here, but basically it's gonna use a data link to provide additional features like faster speeds and read receipts and notifications when someone else is in the middle of typing, kind of like iMessage for Android, but supported by individual carriers instead of one hardware manufacturer. However, bare bones basic SMS will probably be sticking around for a while as a trusty backup. So don't look for it to be going away in the near future. Besides, you're gonna need it if you're one of those people who's helping flip phones and fanny packs make a comeback. And thanks to Drop for sponsoring this video with their control keyboard. It's no secret that gaming consoles have become more PC-like than ever. Gone are the days of ultra-custom hardware and ROM cartridges, with gaming boxes now mostly being built from components that resemble off-the-shelf parts that you'd get for a normal PC. And perhaps no console is a better example of this than the Xbox family from Microsoft, especially with their forthcoming Xbox Series X that even looks suspiciously like a PC. I mean, remember guys, this is the same company that makes Windows, and they're even pushing developers to code on the universal Windows platform, which makes games very easy to port between PCs and Xboxes. So then why is it that it is virtually impossible to install Windows on your Xbox and just use it as a do-it-all device that can both play games and do other stuff? To answer this, we collaborated with fellow YouTuber Modern Vintage Gamer and we'd like to thank him for his contributions. So it turns out that Microsoft has taken great pains to prevent clever gamers from doing this for reasons that range from preventing cheating in multiplayer to stopping users from running pirated games. And most of these efforts have taken the form of hardware tweaks. Although the Xbox system is x86-64 based, just like your desktop PC, a great deal of customization has taken place on top of this underlying architecture that makes it incompatible with Windows. For instance, the Xbox One Southbridge, 
the chip that connects the CPU to the input-output devices like USB and networking is a custom Microsoft design that would require specifically written drivers to work properly with Windows. And this is also true of the North Bridge, which sits on the CPU package and connects the CPU cores to memory, as well as for the system management controller, which is responsible for basic hardware functions like fan control, indicator LEDs, and making sure that temperatures stay within a normal range. On top of these driver issues, there isn't really a way to get the Windows kernel, the part of the operating system that actually communicates with the system hardware to link up properly with Xbox components. Typically, a hardware abstraction layer in the BIOS needs to sit between the operating system kernel and the hardware, and different HALs are required for an operating system to run on different kinds of hardware. Now, since there isn't a Windows HAL for the Xbox, anyone who wants Windows to run on the Xbox would have to write one from scratch. Aside from these fundamental incompatibilities that are worse than a Scorpio dating an Aquarius, the Xbox is intentionally locked down in other ways. When you boot up your Xbox, it goes through a highly secure boot sequence, very different from a normal PC, and one that Windows wouldn't play very nicely with. The Xbox BIOS also presents another major challenge. While Windows uses a file system called NTFS, which you can learn more about right up here, the Xbox uses a custom file system called FATX, not to be confused, by the way, with XFAT, continuing Microsoft's proud tradition of using as many Xs in anything Xbox related as they possibly can. So even if you were able to overcome all of these other limitations and pop in a hard drive or an SSD with Windows installed on it, it turns out that the Xbox BIOS doesn't even support NTFS or even the older Windows compatible FAT32. You would have to somehow flash a BIOS that supports these file systems, but then without writing a hardware abstraction layer for it, there isn't much point to doing it anyway. So bottom line, if you really wanna live out your console as a PC fantasies, just plop an actual PC on your TV stand and connect a controller to it. Or you could learn how to use Linux and install that on your Xbox. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that is just way easier and more compatible and you know more open. Effective learning is active, not passive, and learning from lectures and videos just isn't as good as diving in and doing things yourself. And that is why Brilliant created their problem-solving website and app that gives you a hands-on approach with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. With Brilliant, you get to master concepts by solving fun, challenging problems yourself, and it can be really useful if you're in a STEM course. Their courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve, and their search engines course is super cool. You ever wonder how Google can answer your question in just a fraction of a second, even though there are billions of websites for it to search through? Well, check it out, because the first 200 people who head to brilliant.org slash techquickie are gonna get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So thanks for watching, guys. Like, dislike, check out our other videos. Make sure you go subscribe to Modern Vintage Gamer. Massive shout out for helping us out with this topic and doing some fact checking for us. And as Typically, we think of hardware and software as separate entities that work together to provide us with the computing experience that we know and tolerate. Hardware is the tangible stuff you can touch, like a keyboard or a hard drive, while software is the lines of code that tell the computer to make games, tweets, and CD doings actually appear on your screen. But you may have also heard the word firmware tossed around a fair bit. So what is that? Is it something you buy to show off your buns of steel after spending enough time at the gym? No. Firmware is often thought of as something in between the software and the hardware. It's actually a specific kind of software, but unlike your operating system or any other kind of program, it does not typically sit on a hard drive or an SSD. Instead, firmware can usually be found on dedicated memory chips and it's that fact combined with that it sits very close to the metal that leads people to think of it as kind of like a, a hardware software hybrid unit. But then what does close to the metal mean exactly? Well, the code that makes up firmware communicates very directly with your hardware, unlike a regular program, which has to go through APIs, the operating system and device drivers. And the reason for this is that it's meant to provide a fundamental basic link and method of control for the system's hardware. For example, 
inside of a PC. There's a chip that stores the systems UEFI or BIOS, which are specific types of firmware that you can learn more about right up here. The BIOS starts running as soon as you press the button on your computer, initializing the hardware depending on how you've got it configured and checking for any errors. Once all that's done, the BIOS hands virtually all of its control over to a much more complex operating system, such as Windows or Mac OS. However, the BIOS in older systems provided a simple, reliable link between peripherals like the keyboard and system software even after the operating system started running. Other types of firmware take a much more active role in how a system functions. Your desktop monitor has to decode the digital signal that's sent over an HDMI or DisplayPort cable to create the image that you see, which requires processing. So therefore, it needs some firmware to run the show. When you bring up that on-screen menu, you know, to change the brightness on your monitor or whatever, what you're seeing there is the firmware acting as the monitor's entire operating system. So even very simple devices like a TV remote control need firmware to turn your button mashes into infrared beams that your TV can comprehend. So because firmware is so important to these fundamental linkages, it does sometimes need to be updated in order to provide extra functionality or to fix bugs. A great example is how BIOS updates are issued for motherboards so that they can support a new CPU that uses the same socket, for example. But because most electronics cannot function without firmware, it's often recommended to leave it alone unless there is a specific problem that you know would be fixed with an update. Because if the update fails due to something like a power outage, the system can end up being permanently bricked. Now, unlike a corrupted OS, which can just be wiped and reinstalled, corrupted firmware often can't be fixed as the system can no longer even understand that you want to wipe and reinstall the firmware. It needs not corrupted firmware for that. And while some modern systems try to avoid this problem by having like a second BIOS or firmware as a failsafe, many gadgets lack this option. So make sure that you use caution when you're updating your firmware. Uh, make sure the battery is charged, use a UPS for your desktop PC or your television, and also verify that you're getting firmware from a reputable source like the manufacturer itself. Then there's other firmware that can't be updated at all, either because it's stored on ROM or read-only chips that physically cannot be updated, or because there's some kind of a software lock. Some devices simply don't need firmware updates, like a really simple USB stick, while others use firmware to store proprietary features, making them harder for competitors to figure out. However, software restrictions on firmware can often be easily bypassed, either by installing custom firmware that can sometimes enable additional functionality, or by malicious actors that use firmware as an attack vector. Firmware often has no encryption whatsoever, and developers have mostly been concentrating on making operating systems and applications secure instead, making firmware a target for both hackers and spy agencies, especially because a firmware hack would obviously survive reformatting the hard drive and can be very difficult to detect. And because firmware directly controls hardware, hacked firmware can actually cause physical damage even. There was a proof of concept done a few years ago where a researcher hacked the firmware of an Apple MacBook battery to cause it to overcharge and permanently break. Hopefully, no one will be able to figure out how to hack the firmware of the smart pizza cutter I just bought. Can you imagine? I can't. I have no idea where we were going with this. Oh, I was going to our sponsor, FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the small business accounting software that's custom built for how you want to work. It's a simple way to be more productive, more organized, and of course, to get paid faster. With FreshBooks, you can create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks to get paid up to four days faster. You can see when your client has first viewed your invoice to put an end to the guessing games and the back and forth. And you don't have to take my word for it. Go try it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash techquickie. Just make sure you enter techquickie in the how did you hear about us section. So thanks for watching guys. Like, dislike, check out our other videos and leave a comment with a suggestion for a future fast as possible. We would love to cover it for you so that when you're subscribed, make sure you do that too, you will see it. TVs are not just larger versions of computer monitors. Even today, there are still plenty of differences between them, and for gamers, one of the biggest ones is probably input lag. The amount of time that passes between the TV receiving a signal and outputting it on the screen. 
Now, since most competitive gaming is done on PCs, monitor manufacturers have spent years optimizing this characteristic to keep input lag as low as possible. It isn't difficult to find gaming monitors with around 10 milliseconds of latency. However, because TVs are built more for, you know, idly watching while being a couch potato, their lag times have typically been a lot higher. And just because a TV is high-end in other ways doesn't mean its lag time will be anywhere close to a gaming monitor. It's very easy to spend lots of money on a model with other bells and whistles, yet it has a lag time of around 50 milliseconds or even far higher, so it's crucial to check this spec first. Or if the manufacturer doesn't provide it, get that information from a reputable TV review site like Artings or DisplayLag.com. These days, a set that's good for gaming can easily have input lag of around 20 milliseconds, which is comparable to a decent monitor while others, notably LG's 2019 OLEDs, are down closer to 10, which is darn near the theoretical limit of the tester Linus tech tips used to measure it. To hit this kind of responsiveness, most TVs require that you switch to a special game mode that turns off any lag-inducing post-processing such as AI color enhancement or whatever. And a really cool related feature to look out for is ALLM, or Auto Low Latency Mode. It's part of the HDMI 2.1 spec, and it allows your TV to automatically detect source devices that are used for gaming, so you don't have to be constantly fidgeting with the settings menu. A word of warning though, just because your TV has a game mode doesn't mean it works on all the input ports. Sometimes you have to use a specific one. And it also doesn't mean it actually has a low latency mode. Sometimes it's just another corny preset color setting, so do your due diligence. Moving on, size matters. You might be tempted to grab a large model for Netflix binging, but a smaller screen can actually be advantageous if you're going to be doing lots of gaming. Unlike movies and TV shows where the action is often focused on one part of the screen, something happening toward the periphery in a video game can be very important, with dire consequences if you miss it. And miss it you might if you have a screen that takes up too much of your field of vision. And of course, unlike Netflix, there's no rewinding if you get fragged. You'll also want to consider panel type. One nice thing about gaming on a TV is that while there are very few OLED monitors out there, OLED TVs are plentiful, albeit more expensive. The pixels that make up OLED displays have extremely fast response times, meaning that they can change colors very quickly. This helps cut down on motion blur in fast-paced titles, and OLEDs also have very good viewing angles. So an OLED TV might be a good choice if you're a fan of local multiplayer games with many people sitting in one room, like if you're doing 8-person Smash or something. However, remember that OLED TVs are also more susceptible to burn-in, so you run the risk of damaging your display from having the same graphics, like a heads-up display or a speedometer on your screen all the time. So if that sounds like you, the good news is that the response times and viewing angles of modern LCDs have come a long way. Another important spec to look at is refresh rate. Historically, TVs run at a 60Hz refresh rate, similar to monitors. But if you only go higher, there are a lot of options out there. Just be careful. Unlike gaming monitors, many TV manufacturers advertise fake refresh rates, which you can learn more about up here, which are achieved using trickery like motion interpolation to make movements appear smoother. So what you'll want to find is a TV that can natively accept a 120Hz input. And again, independent review sites can often confirm not only whether this is even possible on a given model, but which resolutions this mode can support. See, it's common for a 4K TV to be capped at 60 hertz at full resolution, but still run at 120 at 1080 or 1440p. This feature is especially important if you're using your TV with a PC that can spell lots of frames, or if you want a next-gen console like Microsoft's upcoming Project Scarlet, which is supposed to support 120 hertz for certain titles. Some TVs now also finally support variable refresh rate technology, which prevents screen tearing and stutter. If you're on a PC with an NVIDIA graphics card, look for one with HDMI VRR and a G-Sync compatible badge. For console gamers, anything with VRR or FreeSync will do you just fine. Finally, you'll want to make sure your TV has support for 4K and whichever flavor of HDR your PC or console supports. However, do keep in mind that the input lag issues we previously mentioned can actually get worse with 4K and HDR enabled. So if responsiveness is of paramount importance to you due to the types of games you play, you could always just buy a 1080p set and then immediately regret that you paid extra to stream Netflix in 4K. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Everybody knows effective learning is active, not passive. It wasn't too long ago that if you were building or upgrading a... Okay, so... First off, we should probably clarify that we can't possibly cover every product Google has ever killed off. Even if we tried, we'd probably miss one, as they've axed around 200 products and services over the years, and the name of the channel is Tech Quickie, not 
tech lengthy. <laughs> One of Google's interesting offerings to get kiboshed, though, was Google Answers. Launched all the way back in 2001, the idea was actually to get curated answers to both tech and general knowledge questions by Google staffers, instead of just any bozo with a keyboard and an internet connection. There's lots of those. Although it was initially free, Google later started charging a small fee for the service, which was then split between Google and the researchers themselves, and users could even leave a tip for the staffer that answered their question. Google Answers ended up gaining a cult following, and I think most of us would agree it was far better than getting answers from some Yahoo. Get it? Unfortunately, the user base was just never all that big, and while one of Google's public missions is to provide information, they decided there were easier ways to do it than by employing a team of trivia experts. They shut down Answers in 2006, though a second free iteration continued operating until 2014 in countries whose websites weren't well indexed by Google. Moving on, did you know that YouTube wasn't Google's first foray into video hosting? What? Back in 2005, Google launched the simply named Google Video, which was originally designed to be a repository of searchable video that anyone could use, especially useful as they offered unlimited length downloads at a time when YouTube videos were limited to only 15 minutes. They even started selling downloads of major motion pictures in 2009. Now, by this point, Google had already acquired YouTube, and the company's other, separate video hosting service became largely redundant. Plus, Google Video had more of a reputation for hosting academic and instructional videos rather than the wide variety of content YouTube was offering. So Google Video's catalog was merged into YouTube and Google Video was shut down in 2012. But now let's talk about some of Google's failed hardware offerings, starting with the Nexus Q from 2012, which was undoubtedly a cool looking piece of kit that bore a passing resemblance to an Echo Spot, just without a screen. It was a streaming media player that could send video from Google Play or YouTube to a connected TV or play audio from Google Play over speakers connected via a built-in amplifier. Okay, so it was like an early Smart TV dongle or Nvidia Shield with super basic functionality. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? Here was the catch. It was $300! Many reviewers also realized quickly that the Nexus Q's companion app was quite buggy. Although it had some premium features like banana plug connectors and an amplifier that sounded pretty darn good, the Nexus Q never actually went on sale to the public and was later replaced by the much more sensibly priced Chromecast. It was $35. Last up in today's episode is a gadget that probably wasn't as good as the smartphone camera you've got in your pocket right now. But it cost a pretty penny. Google Clips, introduced in 2018. This was a miniature camera whose main appeal was that it used Google-built artificial intelligence to know when something interesting happened in front of it. The camera would then automatically start recording whatever goings-on were in progress and save them to a wirelessly connected phone. Of course, the immediately obvious problem here is that the Clips camera didn't exactly have the same opinions as a human on what qualified as interesting content. Not to mention it was pretty limited in terms of recording capability. It couldn't capture audio, it only recorded 15 frames per second, and the lens couldn't move around on its own. Plus, you had to put it a few feet in front of a space where you already expected something interesting to happen. And at 250 bucks, it was hard to see how this was better than just busting out a phone yourself and hitting record. So it wasn't surprising when Google stopped selling the Clips camera in October 2019. That was a month ago at the time of filming. So is there another obscure or not so obscure Google product you want us to cover in a future episode? Let us know in the comments, even if it's not quite dead yet. It could be only mostly dead. It wasn't too long ago that if you wanted good or even passable sound from your computer, you'd need a dedicated sound card. But nowadays, even though you can still buy them, most PC enthusiasts recommend you skip the sound card entirely and just instead use the audio that's integrated into your motherboard. So how did this happen? To understand, we need to take a look back at why dedicated sound cards even existed in the first place. You know that little PC speaker that comes with some motherboards that beeps at you or let you know that your computer booted okay or, or has some kind of issue? Well, way back. During the 1980s, when the original IBM PC and compatibles ruled the day, a larger version of that little speaker was the 
only source of sound for many users. This means that you would be limited to just beeps and boops, though there were some tricks that programmers used to get the PC speaker to make other sounds, such as this Bach piece that was used as the intro to a 1982 classic called Paratrooper. As you can tell, the speaker didn't exactly sound all that great, and early PC CPUs also had to more or less drop everything else they were doing while that speaker was trying to chirp at you. So obviously a better solution was needed. So the idea was to offload audio processing to a separate sound card so that the system wouldn't have to depend solely on the main CPU. And as the years went by, sound cards supported more and more features and better and better audio quality, partly due to their role as hardware accelerators, meaning that the extra hardware on the sound card could do the heavy lifting of processing all that audio instead of leaving it all to the CPU. Similar actually to the difference between having a discrete graphics card and onboard graphics except uh, without a dedicated area on the CPU die for audio. And while it is true that integrated audio for motherboards became more prevalent in the late 1990s thanks to Intel's AC97 audio codec that got incorporated into onboard chips, sound cards were still more powerful solutions that delivered noticeably better quality. So folks that care about audio didn't have much reason to ditch sound cards just yet. That said, sound cards weren't perfect. Because hardware acceleration for audio was implemented differently by different manufacturers, you needed a specific driver for your card to work properly. Kind of like how you need a specific AMD or Nvidia driver these days for your graphics card to function. And these drivers were often notoriously poorly written and unstable. So starting in Windows Vista, Microsoft tried to standardize how audio was handled, which also enabled features like per application volume control from the operating system itself. And did it by forcing the system to handle audio in software instead of through a hardware accelerated card. This meant that the CPU was suddenly handling a lot more audio processing. And in games and other applications that were built around hardware acceleration in the form of a sound card, many users experienced buggy audio and performance issues early on. However, the good news is that by this point, CPUs were already powerful enough to handle audio processing without a big performance hit a far cry from the early PCs we mentioned previously. So as applications started to catch up and support software-based standards like Microsoft's universal audio architecture, it became the case that all you needed for good quality sound was a modern CPU and an audio device that supported UAA, such as those Realtek HD audio chips that are now ubiquitous on all motherboards. These chips are much simpler than full-blown sound cards, as much of the work that would be done by a sound card's processor can be handled by the main CPU of the system, leaving the real tech chip to handle simpler tasks like digital to analog conversion. And as quality has improved on the real tech chips themselves, and motherboard manufacturers have taken care in designing their audio circuits so that they won't be as affected by electrical interference from the rest of the system, today we're at the point where onboard audio is actually quite good. Separate sound cards, while they can still give slightly better audio quality, are often only recommended for enthusiasts who need the extra processing muscle for niche applications or for specific ports. But even users who need a bit more power for their high impedance headphones are often advised to get an external DAC slash amp instead of a sound card, as external solutions are often isolated completely from the electrically noisy environment inside a PC. But if you do end up needing a sound card for some reason, don't think that their development has been totally neglected. I mean, after all, you can get them with RGB. This video is brought to you by Monday.com. Monday.com. When you think of an emulator, you probably think of something that allows you to play copies of games that you, of course, acquired in a totally legit way on a different system. So th think a Game Boy emulator for your smartphone or an N64 emulator for your desktop PC. And the fact that you need a special program to run these games makes intuitive sense, right? You're trying to run a game designed for a completely different piece of hardware. But hold on, because you need emulators for some of your old PC games too, even if you're trying to play them on another PC. I mean, sure, modern hardware is quite a bit faster than whatever you were using 20 years ago, but it still should be more or less compatible, shouldn't it? So why do you still need a program like, say, DOSBox to run your old games? 
While yes, we did give an overview of various reasons why new PCs often cannot run old games in this video, right now let's dig a little bit deeper and talk about why ostensibly compatible hardware can still require emulators. You see, back in the day, most computers used 16-bit architectures, both for their CPUs and operating systems, meaning that they handled data in 16-bit chunks and could address 2 to the 16th bytes of memory, so 64 kilobytes. This obviously wasn't very much, so later on, processors like the Intel 386 introduced 32-bit computing, where systems could handle up to 4 gigabytes of memory. However, running old 16-bit software required a bit more work, as the transition to the 32-bit era introduced a couple of significant problems for older programs. One was that programs written for one architecture can't natively run on another. That is, a program written for a 16-bit system can't run on a 32-bit system without some tweaking. The other was that many 16-bit DOS applications ran in a processor mode called real mode, which allowed any program to access any portion of memory space, including portions of memory being used by other programs. This obviously meant that real mode had real security and stability issues, as there were no checks in place to make sure that a malicious or misbehaving program wouldn't get into other parts of the memory and threaten data or take down the system. So a new processor mode called Protected Mode became the norm in the mid-1980s, which isolated memory spaces from each other and gave programs different privilege levels to prevent programs that weren't device drivers or the operating system from executing certain instructions. However, lots of older programs could only operate in real mode. So combined with the 16 to 32-bit transition, 16-bit real mode had to be virtualized through a special mode called Virtual 8086 mode that set up a virtual real mode. And yes, that's definitely an oxymoron. Uh, it set it up by emulating an entire old school 8086 processor. For a long time, having this capability was viewed as essential due to how common 16-bit programs were. Even in versions of Windows based on Windows NT, which didn't run on top of DOS, a built-in emulator called NTVDM allowed old-school DOS programs to run. NTVDM is present, or can at least be installed, in every 32-bit version of Windows NT, including Windows 10. However, NTVDM has its own issues, such as low refresh rates, poor audio support, and an inability to slow down modern CPUs, which can make games run way too fast. But this still doesn't explain why old-school DOS games often won't run at all on new systems. The issue is that nowadays, most systems are shipping with 64-bit operating systems rather than 32-bit, primarily because they can support more than 4 gigabytes of memory. However, running a 64-bit OS requires an entirely new processing mode called Long Mode which would have required Microsoft to build a whole new piece of software to virtualize a 16-bit environment for running really old programs. And while 16-bit programs were still important when 32-bit computing became popular, back when we were all using operating systems like Windows 95, they're basically considered obsolete in the If you're a gamer, it seems like every new piece of tech on the PC market is trying to capture your attention. From graphics cards with ever so slightly higher boost clocks to headset stands tricked out with RGB lighting. Ugh, so cool. But one of the latest things you might want to actually pay attention to is Wi-Fi 6, also known as 802.11ax, which our friends at Intel asked us to talk about today. Now, we've already done a video explaining Wi-Fi 6 more generally, which you can check out right up there, but today we're going to specifically talk about how it can benefit gamers who don't want to be tethered down by an Ethernet connection figuratively and literally. Speed is one of the most obvious improvements of Wi-Fi 6 over previous generations of Wi-Fi. The theoretical max bandwidth of a typical 2x2 connection is 2.4 gigabits per second, which is about three times as fast as the previous generation. However, real world speeds won't be that high. Somewhere around one and a half gigabits per second might be more realistic. And of course, you're gonna be limited by however fast your internet connection is anyway, unless you're playing on a wireless LAN. But the real benefit for gamers isn't just the extra speed to download large games, but also how Wi-Fi 6 handles having multiple devices on the same network at once, as well as improvements to latency and responsiveness. It's like Wi-Fi took caffeine pills. You see, Wi-Fi 6 supports an updated version of a feature called Mimo, And no, it's not a Pokemon. Although it may not seem like it, a router without Mimo can only communicate with one device at a time, meaning all the other devices on your network have to wait their turn. 
And while it isn't exactly a long wait, it can still make a difference, especially if that device's parents didn't teach it to be patient. Moomimo gets rid of this bottleneck by allowing your router to communicate with multiple devices at once. And with Wi-Fi 6, up to eight devices on a network can take advantage of this capability, up from the four devices supported by Wave 2 versions of Wi-Fi 5 and its cousin, Wi-Fi 555. And because Wi-Fi 6 will support upstream and downstream data transfer simultaneously on all eight devices, laggy game behavior caused by your PC having to wait for a slice of upstream time should be reduced. Especially if someone else on your network is engaged in some kind of bandwidth heavy activity, like uploading every video they've taken of their cat, because there aren't enough cat videos on the internet, Karen! Another helpful feature is called OFDMA, and although that's a mouthful, the way it works is actually really cool and totally legal. Do you, know <laughs> Do you know how your Wi-Fi network lives on a single channel? Well, what ODFMA does is instead of just using the whole channel to talk to just one device, it divvies up the channel into smaller sub-channels so that data can be transferred to multiple devices at one time. The way the channels are chopped up depends on the needs of each device. So if you're gaming, pieces of data that need to be sent to or from your PC quickly to prevent lagginess can be prioritized over another user whose workload isn't as latency dependent, such as a large file download. So the bottom line for gamers is fewer drop frames and more reliable connections that will keep you from lagging out or getting fragged if you're not playing over a wired connection. And with cloud-based gaming services like PlayStation Now and Google Stadia on the rise, having a connection you can count on will become even more important if you're planning to game without an expensive rig or console. Unfortunately, Wi-Fi 6 will likely require you to buy new devices, both a router and a wireless adapter or motherboard that support the new protocol. However, if you're tired of tripping over ethernet cables when you have to run to the bathroom while you queue for a match, the extra cost might just be worth it. Speaking of being worth it, our sponsor even if you see your electronic devices as long-term investments when you buy them, eventually they'll reach the point where they've simply outlived their usefulness, and it's time to trade them in for some cold, hard cash. But how can you be sure that you're getting enough in return for it to be worth your while? First off, before you do anything else, make sure there's actually a market for whatever it is you're trying to sell. You'll probably find plenty of buyers for, say, a relatively recent iPhone that's in good condition, but on the flip side, you probably won't have much luck selling a used inkjet printer when manufacturers are actually selling brand new ones for less than the cost of the included ink. And you can learn more about why they do that up here. So I usually start by having a look around on a site like eBay to get a feel for the demand before wasting any more of my time and energy. This market research stage also serves to give me an idea of how much I can reasonably ask and what kinds of offers might be way too low. Remember guys, you wanna check what similar items have sold for rather than getting caught up on what they are listed for. The next step after deciding you have a decent chance at finding an interested buyer is to prepare your item properly. It seems like a small thing, but you definitely have a better chance of getting top dollar if you have all the original accessories and packaging materials, and you take a few extra minutes to take clear, well-lit photos that show that the item and its accessories have been cared for. Now, if you don't have the original packaging, that's not the end of the world, but it is worth trying to find something decent to box the item up in. You can sometimes order boxes for popular items like iPhones, but if it's something less common, sometimes local stores will have, for example, a motherboard box, even if it's not one that's for the same motherboard that you happen to be selling. Good packaging might not make a difference to this particular sale, by the way, but it will almost certainly help to avoid negative feedback, which could affect your next one. So once you've gotten as much packaging together as you can and cleaned up the product to the best of your ability, you wanna decide where you're going to try to sell it. If you're looking to get actual cash for it, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, eBay, and app-based marketplaces like LetGo are obvious choices, but don't assume that they will always be the best solutions. Although these sites are fine to use, there are regional advantages to one versus another. Here in Canada, for example, nobody back east uses Craigslist, and then no one in the west uses Kijiji. And you can often get more money by listing your wares on private, specialized marketplaces that focus on one category of gadget, like photography gear. Some of these sites do charge small fees to discourage scammers, but you can often still come out ahead, especially if your stuff is in pretty good shape. 
However, if you're okay with trading in your gear for gift cards at a retailer, especially useful if your stuff is damaged, do some shopping around to see who will cut you the best deal. Sites like Flipsy and Glide can quickly compare offers if you don't want to bother finding an individual to sell to, but keep in mind guys, you probably won't walk away with as much in your pocket. Kind of like how places like GameStop are notorious for lowballing the public on game trade-ins so that they can turn around and make a profit reselling them. Once you've decided to list, make sure that you not only have good photos and detailed specs, but that you're paying attention to the words that you use because they can affect how appealing your listing sounds. Just like an online dating profile, you want to make your gadget sound attractive. So avoid words like old and consider why people might want it. Is it vintage or retro? Understanding who might want your item and using the right lingo can make a big difference if, for example, you're trying to invoke a potential buyer's sense of nostalgia. And speaking of which, consider when you should be selling. For example, if you're selling a graphics card or a CPU, I've always found that keeping an eye on the rumors of the upcoming new products and trying to get rid of my existing stuff proactively before something new replaces it allows me to recoup much more of my original cost. And if you have something that you think won't fetch too much money at the moment, you may also consider holding on to it for a while. Some items can become hard to find replacements, or even popular collector's pieces once enough time has passed, like those classic IBM Model M keyboards. Finally, selling around the holidays when people are in a buying mood is never a bad idea, especially since plenty of us have no interest in waking up at four in the morning to go into a giant Black Friday brouhaha. Isn't that a great word, brouhaha? Speaking of great words, FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the small business accounting software that's custom built for how you want to work. FreshBooks is a simple way to be more productive, more organized, and to get paid faster. With FreshBooks, you can create and send professional looking invoices in less than 30 seconds. You can set up online payments with just a couple of clicks to get paid up to four days faster. You can see when your client has seen your invoice to put an end to the guessing games, and you can take the whole experience with you on the go with their fully featured apps for iOS and Android. For an unrestricted 30-day free trial, just go to freshbooks.com slash techquickie and enter techquickie in the how did you hear about us section. Thanks for watching, guys. Like, dislike, check out our other videos, and subscribe. Especially Whether we're talking dollars in your bank account, items on a seafood buffet, or dates you've got lined up on Tinder, more is generally considered to be better. A sentiment that also seems to hold true with the number of cores in your computer's CPU, at least if you buy into the marketing. But hold on. Even though having many cores definitely gives you a boost in multi-threaded applications like rendering 3D animations, there are actually situations where more cores gives no benefit whatsoever or can even actually hurt your system's performance. But how could this be? Well, to start off with, the more cores you pack onto a CPU, the more power they need and the more heat they generate. And remember that because CPU cores are crammed into a relatively small space, manufacturers end up working against some serious limits when it comes to thermal design power or TDP. This means that to prevent the CPU from drawing too much power and producing too much heat, the individual cores have traditionally run their clock frequencies lower to improve efficiency. And even if the advertised boost clock for a CPU with lots and lots of cores can appear to be high, it's often the case that they cannot maintain these clocks for long periods of time, or that they only do it when you're running very light applications. So if you're using your computer mostly for applications where single-threaded performance matters more, such as games, that super expensive 18-core CPU might actually yield you a worse experience than something cheaper. And if you go with a really high core count CPU, there's another wrinkle with how processors with that many cores access the system memory. You see, in some cases, these larger CPUs need to have their cores split into two groups or nodes of cores, with each group getting its own memory controller and segment of the physical memory in a scheme called non-uniform memory access, or NUMA. Oh,